Hello and welcome back to the Young Entrepreneur's Journey podcast. And it is my absolute pleasure today to introduce to you Alec Torelli, who is a poker player or a former poker player and now an entrepreneur. And the first question that I ask everyone on this podcast is, what originally got you onto your entrepreneurial journey? That's a good question. So I, I guess the business side of things was sort of an extension of poker because poker is you're, you're your own boss. You have, you make your own schedule to sometimes to a, to a fault where you have like no rules or restrictions. So it's, you have to be very disciplined to get things done. Um, and then, you know, you're working for yourself. You have to go to the table to make money. And, and so you, you get the experience of what it's like to have your own mini person one business because you have to manage your money correctly, especially in a game like poker where there's significant amounts of risk. So you do learn a lot of the skills that do translate well, I feel like over to the business world and, and we could talk about that more in the episode. But um, for me, it was about a desire to share what I learned because I felt like I was at a point in my poker career where I had done what I want, wanted as a player and I felt like I reached my goals as a player and I accomplished a lot of what I wanted to do in my poker career. And this was granted like 10 years into me playing poker and eight or nine years into me playing professionally. I opened a YouTube account and I started sharing strategy with the world largely for free. And so that... I also did this at a time where there was not much poker content being created on YouTube. This was like 2014. And I was one of the first people, if I think the first person to do um, a style of content on YouTube called Hand of the Day, where I broke down an interesting hand of poker I played somewhere around the world uh, or hands in the future that people, my students would send to me and I would review these hands for free on YouTube. And this really caught on. So I built up a large following. And then over time I realized, wow, like these people are asking me questions. A lot of people were saying, Hey, do you do coaching or do you have a product I could buy? Or do you have all these strategies in a book or a course? And so I started to realize people have a demand for a product. And I was like, Oh, okay, well, why don't I just, instead of, answering the questions on the phone with people that I started coaching or just answering them in these videos, why don't I put this into a linear format that people can follow? So this was the birth of what then became my poker training school, which is called Conscious Poker, where I train people to be winning poker players and help them achieve their poker goals and even build a lifestyle around poker that they, they like or help them make a side income from poker. And uh, I have a lot of courses and books and, and uh, workbooks and a, a membership site. And so it kind of evolved naturally. And then I had to, you know, kind of put my business hat on and learn email marketing and a lot of things yeah. that you have to learn with a business, like running Facebook ads and hiring people and finding great people to work with me that I could work with from anywhere in the world because I, I travel all the time for poker and coaching and whatnot. And so I had to learn these skills along the way, but uh, poker was integral part of that. And it's fun. It's to me, I always look at it like playing a game. Yeah. It is it's kind of funny when you veer into the world of business, you suddenly have to take on all of these different hats. You suddenly need realize that you need to learn so many different skills and you need to do everything. But I think what's interesting is the fact that you specialized in poker and then it was kind of your passion. It was a thing that you're excited about. And then you decided, oh, people are actually interested in what I'm interested in. I actually have mastered a skill set to the point that I can really add value to that specific niche. And so what I think would be really cool to dig into is back in the early days when you decided to take on poker, because I think when a, when a lot of people are young, they don't really know what they want to do. So I'm wondering what that story was like for you and how that kind of played out in the early days. Well, I discovered poker when I was 16. I got invited to a friend's house and he's like, hey, you want to play poker with me and my friends? And it was just cool at the time. Like this guy named Chris Moneymaker, if you can believe that, his last name was Moneymaker. He had That's won nice. the biggest tournament in the world for over a million dollars and he qualified for a hundred dollars. So he turned a hundred dollars into a million. There's like a incredible story. And so poker was really cool. And I was like, sure, I want to go play. And my first time I won $12. And I was just hooked. Like I could, I found something where I was never great in sports in school. I didn't make the freshman basketball team. I dropped out of football. I was in musical theater. So like I found something that I could win at against my friends and it was dumb luck my first time, but I really fell in love with the game. And so I think the key here is that I, I found something that I knew right away that I was really in love with and I wouldn't have to use willpower or effort to want to get better. It just came naturally. So I think the key is like scratch. And this was serendipitous. I wasn't looking for a business idea. I wasn't looking for my calling in life. I was 16. I was in high school. I had no idea what I wanted to do, nor did I care. Um, but I did find something that I really felt like I connect, can connect to. And that was just dumb luck. 
But a lot of people listening might be in a place where they're really looking for what that thing is that they want to do because maybe they're in college or they're looking to start a business or whatnot. And so I would say, I think what I learned out of pure serendipity that I would think would be something that would be a takeaway is that the, the real key to success, I feel like in my poker career was finding something that I loved so much that I wanted to do it for free. I wasn't trying to make a lot of money playing poker in the beginning. I always said if I played for you know, chocolate or candy, I'd want to be fat. Like I just wanted to win at the game because I loved the process. And so I think that's really the key is finding something that you love so much that you get into a state of flow while you're doing it. You kind of lose sense of time and you're in love with the process of getting better. Because what I always tell my clients is, is that like winning at poker is not your goal when you're playing a hand of poker or you're sitting down at the table or you're investing money. Winning is the byproduct of doing your job correctly. And your, your job as a poker player is to make good decisions and play your hand the best way possible. And to do that, you need to study. You need to work really hard. You need to understand the math and the equities. And it's like chess. It's like there's a lot. It's, it's very easy to learn mm. and move the pieces. It's very hard to beat the best in the world, right? So you have to get really yeah. good. And every niche is like that. Like in order to succeed at whatever niche you're in, you really have to get great at something, not just good or mediocre or competent, to, to be great at something. And, and so um, that's only going to come. Like I, I feel like you could only get so far if you don't have that innate passion. So I found that in poker and that was really the catapult that got me to be able to like go on and be successful and take the risks and, and get on to the last step. But I think that's the, that's the prerequisite there. Yeah, for sure. I think anytime you're doing something that you really truly love that kind of the the net benefit that that brings to your overall life and your overall existence is just incredible because one you're going to really enjoy the process you're going to enjoy the journey you're going to stop being so outcome focused and you're going to enjoy the entire journey all the way up to the de supposed destination which isn't even a destination because at the end of the day life is a journey and yeah so one thing i would propose on that subject is like I think sometimes people have the tendency to, at least in what I observe, to, to be outcome driven and look for the thing that produces the outcome, which is like, okay, what business is going to make the most amount of money? And that's the metric they use. So they go into mm -hmm. that that niche, right? And obviously there has to be a market cap for whatever it is you're doing, right? You can't just like start a terrible business idea that's going to fail just because you were in love with seashells or something like that. But in our niched out world where things are getting even more and more specific, where you can be like a poker expert and have a, a business and it can be a huge business if you, if you want it to be, you can be an expert in many, many things and start a podcast or a YouTube or a blog on that subject. And because the internet is so you know niched out, people will find you and you could eventually sell things in that space. There's different size market caps in many, many things, but you know, I, I think the real key is, is instead of necessarily measuring things with like wh what's going to make the most money, it's like, where are you going to, what are you going to enjoy the most? And I would say like, I'm not sure what the exact formula is, but for sure it's, in my opinion, at least it's worth taking potentially less monetary benefit to have higher enjoyment. So I would, I would encourage people to look on the, the scale of, you know, monetary return and enjoyment and just don't put all the scales on, don't put all the weight on the money side. For, at the expense of the enjoyment side. Obviously, you can't just have all enjoyment and no money. You have to pay the bills. But like, try and find some balance there. And I feel like people that I observe are more too influenced on the money side of things, which ironically, I feel like comes as a byproduct of finding the enjoyment because when you find something you truly love, you're going to be better at it. You're going to be better at it. You're going to enjoy it more. You're going to want to reach a higher level. And then ultimately, as a result of that, you're going to end up producing more returns in that, in that area. And if you think about business as a transaction, and like ultimately the more value you can provide, the more you're going to be re rewarded with monetary compensation. But in order to provide value, you have to be really good at something and to be really good, you have to love what you're doing. So I think it all comes back to that place. I 100% agree. I think mastery is very, very difficult if you're forcing yourself into it. If there's constant resistance every day, you're going to find all of the reasons not to do that thing as opposed to the reasons to do that thing. So I 100% agree with that point. And I think what was interesting earlier is when you were talking about the idea of in poker, it's really important to know how to make the right decisions because there are so many there are so many little micro nuances in play in the game of poker and then you've got to read people and then you've got to like do I call do I bluff do I you know what, what I'm not I'm not like 100% on all of the poker terminology but <laughs> no you got that, it you got it <laughs> thank you um but sort of 
it would be interesting to have your take on that. How do you go about the process of making a decision? Maybe more long-term, but also in that sort of split second in the moment. Because I, I imagine a part of it is in the preparation and a part of it is it in the moment, in the game. You just need to make that snap decision. Yeah, so it's it's quite technical and from, from a technical standpoint. So I'm not going to try and... I'm going to try and stay away from like what I do technically to make a decision, which might lose people in the terminology. And that's more like poker strategy, you know, check out my YouTube or blog or something like that. If you want to know like technically how I navigate through a hand, but what I try to do from a conceptual standpoint and something I think is much more practical for people listening that also applies to life and, and the business world as well is I try and understand the ways in which I make decisions and try and understand the relationship between these these different ways that I make decisions and how they apply to a poker hand or a decision I make in the real world. So let me give you an example. I think there's basically three ways that I or people in general make decisions. We make logical decisions, like rational decisions. We make intuitive or instinctual decisions. And we make emotional or irrational decisions, right? So these are the three types of decisions that you can make. The first type of decision that you make is is usually and always instinctual. It's something that happens immediately. And if you think about when you, it happens in poker this way too, you get a read on someone, you get a feeling about whether they're bluffing or they have a strong hand, but you also get this in the real world as well. Like if I meet someone for the first time or I hear a piece of their content, you're getting a read, so to speak, as if to whether you like them or not. It's not something that you're judging based on, oh, I like this person because their shirt is blue when you meet someone or I'm attracted to this woman because like her hair is blonde. You're, you're, you don't, you can try and quantify it, but it's your subconscious mind trying to quantify things that you can't explain with words. It's just a feeling you have. So that's the first thing that happens. And the instinct, if you think about it, is usually right, right? It's like all our, you know, collective time of evolution trying to quantify something that you just get a read on in a second that's not really explained with words. But the second part of that process is the logic or the rational mind. And it's trying to, you know, once you have this hypothesis, it's saying, okay, is this true or false? Now, let me get to know this person a little bit better, check their resume and like really get to talk to them and see, you know, whether or not we share the same values. And so that's your logical and rational mind trying to understand to to put a conclusion to the hypothesis that you originally had. And then the the last type of decisions we make, the, the frankly, the worst type of decisions we make are emotional decisions. So these are when we're really stressed or like we're in an argument or there's ego that clouds our judgment. And we tell people things that we don't really mean, and then we make mistakes. So the same phenomenon is true in poker. What you're really looking for at the poker table is first you're trying to look for an instinctual read that you have about a person or a situation. Then you're trying to confirm or deny that instinctual read with math, the numbers. You're running the equities. You're determining whether or not you have the right price to call, whether or not your hand is likely to be ahead or behind. And this in the business world might be doing something like your due diligence. You're running, you're doing, you have an hypothesis that your business idea can make a lot of money, but you still need the logical, rational mind to say, okay, let me run the numbers and see if the product is going to sell for more than it costs and create a business plan. And if your intuition matches your business plan, you usually have a great marriage. That's a great place to be. What you want to avoid at all costs are the emotional decisions. So for example, you don't want to necessarily just say, okay, I'm feeling really stressed today and I'm going to make, I'm going to send that email or I'm really pissed at this person. Let me just have a phone call. I mean, you have to have, maybe have a phone call with someone if you're upset to, to convey your thoughts, to resolve an argument, but you don't necessarily want to express all of your emotions in that call in the way that's going to be um, something you say, something you don't really mean. Or for example, in the business world, if uh, you know, the, make a decision about your investments when the market is up or down, for example. You can make an emotional decision rather than a, from a place of logic about what your long-term goals are. That's the decision you want. That's the place from which you want to make a decision about your investment strategy. So I feel like this sort of applies at the poker table and I try and use this framework when making decisions on or off the felt as well. Mm, and how do you tap into your instincts because for example me I'm a very instinctive person so I understand how that works but I understand that there are a lot of people and they have these instincts but maybe they're not so attuned to them do you have any sort of advice on how you can hone into that first instinctual feeling so the first part is being aware of the process of making decisions and then also just being more aware of your thoughts and you can do that through meditation for example I I listened to one of your episodes with with Aaron that that spoke about that it was great um so just that has helped me be more in, internal and more aware, but just 
just being aware that this is something that you need to pay attention to will help you understand, okay, like how do I feel about this person or this situation in the beginning? So just kind of being aware of that and then asking yourself those questions and then maybe sitting down in the morning and journaling first thing about an experience and just having like a complete stream of consciousness thought where like you're, you're actually getting your intuition on paper. And it's hard to do that. So if you just kind of like override your subconscious mind with logic or emotion, that's usually when you make mistakes. When you, when you feel like, for example, I can't trust this person, but then you're blinded by the excitement of the opportunity and you go into business with them anyway, or you go out on a date with them anyway, and you're like, oh, I should have just listened to myself. So the thing is that I think most people kind of know they have that intuition and it's there, but you, we have to sit back and listen to it. So creating some routine, and that's different for everyone. I'm not going to say, you know, you have to meditate or you have to journal or you have to sit quietly in the morning or whatever it is, but you have to find a way that you could bring that out of you. For some people, it's writing. For other people, it's journaling. For other people, it's going on a run. For other people, it's Vikram yoga. Like whatever it is, you got to find something that brings it out of you so that you can listen to it. You have to create space. I feel like most times people are trying to optimize their time so much where like, you know, going to the gym, taking a phone call and listening to a podcast all at once. Whereas what I try and I've tried to do more recently is do one thing at a time place in my life to be able to listen to myself. So when I have a really stressful day, in fact, like the more stress that I have in my day, the more time I take to like sit quietly with my thoughts and, and perhaps meditate for five minutes in between activities, because I need to be really calm and objective and think and focused in the activities that I'm doing. So I feel like it's kind of like reverse engineering in that way. And the second thing is really being aware of who you are as a person and the strengths that you have. So let me give you an example. In poker, there's two schools of thought. There are people that use reads and intuition and poker psychology, and there are people that use game theory and math and numbers. And both strategies win. Like you can be a great people person and understand how someone's going to adjust and how they're going to play and whether they're going to bluff you or not because you're, you're great at understanding people. And you could base your strategy off your feeling if you're playing live poker and get a read on people. You could also be a super genius math wizard, crunch a bunch of numbers and base your strategy on game theory and win as well. But the key is understanding where your strengths lie and finding a way to play to your strengths. So instead of trying to plug your weaknesses, you know, understand what tool you are. And if you're a hammer, look for a nail. If you're a drill, look for a screw. And so it's about understanding like, okay, I'm a really intuitive person that works really well for me. That's the way I sort of make decisions, play to that strength. If instead you're a really analytical person and you find that you always make a whiteboard of pros and cons in a, in a Google spreadsheet, then run the numbers. Granted, you should probably do both and they should both sort of check out, but like you have to also play to your strengths as well. 100%. It's never a one size fits all approach. There are so many different variations of human on the planet that um, you know, everyone is different and everyone has a different sort of composite of the way that their personality works, the way that their brain works. I think one of these really common uh, drilled in social programmings of our society is that, oh, you need to get better at your weaknesses. You're bad at that. You need to get better at that. But actually, when you flip the script and completely hone in on your strengths and double down on that, you are going to make waves in ways that you would never have been able to do that with your weaknesses. So that's a really interesting point. Um, I'm completely with you. I totally agree on that. Like there's yeah. so many things, actually, I think it's quite polar, meaning like extreme on one end and extreme on the other end. When I think about the things that I'm really, really good at or really, really knowledgeable about, like they're very, very few. And the things that I'm not good at or not knowledgeable about are the majority. So I'm really focused on the one or two areas that I shine, the things that I do better than my opponents or my competition or, or, or whatever it is and my style of teaching that makes me unique in poker when it comes to being a coach or whatever it is. And I'm really spending all of my time on those activities. I'm spending all of my energy on those activities. Um, and so I'm not really focused on the other things because other people are better than me at that. So I can't compete at those things. And so yeah. that's, that's, that's what I feel like, um, where we should be focused. We should focus like 95% of our time on the one or two or 5% of things that we're, we're really great at. Exactly. If you look at all of the top players and the top business people, they focus on their strengths and then they hire everything out. They hire out people who can uh, code the program or do the marketing that they're not that good at. They all outsource that. So they really have that time and that space and they free up that traction in their life to go full in on their strengths. So great, great point. 
And another interesting thing that you were talking about earlier was sort of the idea of reading people in poker because yep. you want to know whether they're calling, whether they're bluffing. And I think there are some very powerful lessons there that transfer to the world of business because business is comprised of people, not just numbers. Yeah. So if you know how to read people, if you understand what the layout, what the, what the situation is there, then you're going to make so much more money. Yeah, that's true. And so like one of the exercises I always tell my clients to do is if you really want to get better at playing people and understanding the situations where you're not influenced by your emotion or the situation, you should play poker without looking at your cards. Because then the only thing you have where all your energy is spent is channeling your reads and your, your feelings. So you're, you're, you're looking at the situation and you're saying, okay, I don't have all the information. I'm not biased by the fact that my hand is strong or my hand is weak or whatever. I'm just looking at what does he have? is he bluffing or not? And like, if he's, if I think he's bluffing, I'm going to raise, I don't know what I have, but I'm just going to play the situation. And so I think that's a great exercise that, that really has helped me hone my reading skills. I'm not exactly sure how it would apply to the business world going maybe like, you know, like on a, on a silent date or something like that, where you do like those, like no talking speed dating or something like that. Um, but that's a really good thing. It's just like, trying to be conscious of that when you're talking with someone and understanding like what well, well, this happens all the time in the real world, right? What people are saying is not actually what they're really saying or what they mean. Like if you ask, a, maybe the trivial example, like you ask a friend like, Hey, what do you think about this? Are they really giving you your honest answer? And like, it's your job to be like, Hey, look, I feel like you're telling me this because you want, you don't want to hurt my feelings, but what I, you, you know, I don't feel like you're telling me what you really think. And so like being, you know, trying to be aware of those sorts of circumstances and not just taking everything at face value and using, like we talked about before, there's the rational mind, which interprets things at face value. The rational mind says, okay, this person is saying this to me, this is what they mean. But the instinctual mind, like your, your subconscious is trying to infer the body language or the facial motions or the way that someone's reacting to what you're saying. And so what I try and do in a conversation is use more of the instinctual side of things. Like if someone's, if someone is giving me positive like cues and body language when I'm talking. That's, that's, a, that's usually what I'm looking for to like, that my point is hitting home if they're, but if they say, Oh, that was really interesting, but it was clear to me that they didn't really mean that I would yeah. take their in their facial interpretation more, give that more weight than what they actually said, because what they said might just be a triviality or they're trying to be polite or they don't want to hurt my feelings. So I think it's yeah. up to us to really try and uh, you know, discern what people are saying in different ways. And so you have to be able to use the instinctual side as much as the rational side, but being able to being aware that there's a separation between these two things and then giving more importance to the uh, instinctual side of things, I think it goes a long way when it comes to dealing with other people as well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's crazy the power of the subconscious mind and how all of the things that your brain is piecing together under the conscious mind, the things that it notices, you know, when you have that gut feeling, you just feel like something's wrong and you don't know why. And often, you know, there was a really interesting thing. I was reading this book um, and it was talking about an idea of a dog. And you know, when a dog barks and the dog goes crazy yeah. and, and you think, oh, something must be wrong because the dog's saying something's wrong and off with this dude. The dog's not barking at the off dude. The dog is barking at your instinctual reaction to something being off with the dude <laughs> that you're not attuned to. So it's pretty crazy how that works. Um, and obviously the things that you were saying between all of the, like you need to be able to read the body language, the face, the voice, the words, it's all a whole composite picture. And obviously it's not an exact science. Um, so I think that was really interesting. Thank and you. Yeah, I think we've gotten worse at this over time too, because we're overstimulated now. And as if you think about our history as hunter gatherers, we were probably way more in yeah. tune with, our instincts leading us to the right conclusion. Whereas now we're overstimulated with social media and news and, and everything, right? So our attention spans yeah. have gotten shorter. We are looking for dopamine hacks more often just from stimulation outside. And so like that, all these things press our instincts because we're not allowing space in our life to listen to them because we're stimulated all the time by noise. And so I think creating more space in our life uh, is huge to be in touch more with like is are the decisions we're making in the short term in line with our North star in the long term? you know, just taking the space yeah. to kind of, to connect with those things. I feel like it's, is so important and in general, but even more so as you know, tech grows exponentially and it comes more integrated into our life. For sure. Apparently humans have 
a lower attention span than a goldfish now, which is quite embarrassing for our species. But I'm wondering, how do you then integrate that space into your life to be able to make good decisions, both short term and long term? And maybe that sort of feeds into the way that you plan your life within like short term and long term goals as well. Thank you. Yeah, good question. So the touching on what I said earlier, like my strategy isn't the strategy, it's just mine. And I think the challenge is for everyone to treat this like a game and really Mm. look to be optimizing for them and understanding that listening and replicating to what another influencer does may or may not work for you. So there's all these blogs about like, this is the best way to do this, or this is the best way to do that. It might just work for that person. And it might be what's working for you, but it's coincidental. And so I think it's up to all of us to kind of like, you know, throw darts on the wall and see what sticks and just take little things for everyone. So I'm always trying and I'm always tweaking and I'm always doing what works for me, but I'm hesitant to say like, this is what everyone should do. Obviously certain things have, have common threads and seem to work for a lot of people like eating healthy, exercising, meditating, people like taking cold showers. And and there's all these trendy things that seem to be um, helping with these sorts of things like yoga and mindfulness and whatnot. But, um, yeah, that's part of it. And then I would say like to answer your other question, I kind of this, I try and make sure that first and foremost, I'm clear on my North star and what the primary aim in my life is in the macro. So what is like the big picture and what am I really trying to accomplish? Um, and then I try and say to myself, okay, like these are the things that are really important to me. These are my core values. And so for me, for example, I'll share some of mine. It's, it's, it's having freedom, excitement, and choices in my life. So freedom meaning like the ability to be able to be where I want, independent of location, or being able to control my time. So that's the metric to which I, I make decisions. I don't necessarily do it for, like if I'm, if I'm given the choice between something that will infringe upon my time dramatically, but give me more money, I would be very skeptical of that decision because my biggest, my biggest asset to me personally, and what I value my biggest, um, the thing that I try and protect the most is where I could spend my time and how I could spend my time. So I would rather potentially give up a monetary opportunity to protect my time rather than the other way around. So once I'm clear on what that goal is, um, excitement, meaning like, you know, doing different things and being able to travel and go different places and choices, meaning I could just decide where I want to be and what I want to do at any, at any given time or pursue a new hobby or, or, or those sorts of things. And so for that, I like to be like, okay, well, these are the, these are my folk. This is my focus. This is my North star this is what I'm trying to accomplish in my life. So then I go back to the two types of decisions that I typically, or anyone I think typically makes the macro decisions, which are the big decisions we make in life and the micro decisions, the small decisions we make on a daily basis. And so I try and make sure that both of these subsets of decisions are in line with getting me closer to my North star, not taking me further away. So the first part is being aware that every decision I make is either going to draw me closer or take me further away. And then taking full responsibility for that and being like, it's up to me to make sure that I'm steering the ship where I want it to go, not just putting it in the water and hoping that the current takes me there. So in the macro, it's like things like, okay, I really value, um, I talked about this in one of the keynotes I gave, uh, I really value having a lot of freedom in my life. And so my wife and I were talking about getting a dog and like, I would really love to get a dog and I always wanted one and whatever. But at the same time, it's like, that would tie me down to a specific location, perhaps more than I really want to be tied at this point in time. And so like, it is a sacrifice not to have a dog. I'd actually love to have one, all things being equal. But Um, the reason I haven't gotten one at this point is just because it's like not necessarily conducive to traveling full time or not necessarily full time, but traveling often spending, you know, six months a year in different places, uh, would be very difficult. And so it's about making sacrifices, what I call conscious trades. It's not necessarily a sacrifice because you're getting more of what you truly value at the expense of something you value a little bit less. And in the micro, and it's also being aware that these things might change over time. So revisiting your goals once a year, once every six months, whatever, taking, again, creating space, maybe going on a two or three day trip to the mountains and just saying, okay, like, where am I? Am I still, is my ship still going the right way? Like you have it on autopilot, but you can't just leave it on autopilot for two decades because, you know, you, you change as a person and things change and circumstances change. And then in the micro, it's about the same thing, like understanding, okay, where is the money that I'm spending on a daily basis going? And is that like, is it better to save this money and spend it on something that I value more in the future? So a trivial example is like, you always have the choice to spend money on like, dining out or clothes or material or buying new things. But for us, it's about like, okay, we really value taking those 
couple trips a year that are really meaningful to us. And those are like bulk purchases that cost more money. So by reallocating money in the micro areas where I don't really find much value or utility, like clothes, not really meaningful to me. Um, buying things, don't really care. Drive an old, an old car, don't have a car in the US. Like these things just aren't that important to me at this point in my life. So I'm saying like, okay, I'm going to not, I'm going to make a conscious trade. I'm going to not spend money. I'm going to be binary. I'm going to spend like zero or the least amount of money possible in all these areas of my life that, that just don't mean anything to me. And I'm going to spend a lot, all that money I'm going to save and maybe invest in my retirement or whatever. But when I do spend it, I'm going to spend it in this area of my life, like travel and creating memories and experiences, because that is what's truly important to me. So instead of, for example, I have an iPhone seven, I didn't buy a new one in four years, but like that $2,000 we save every year, not buying new five phones every year, you know, that money can be spent on in a three week, in a five day or week long vacation somewhere. And so like, that's the conscious trade that I think people have to make in the micro where it's like about making sure that both of these things align with your North star. Yeah, for sure. I think, and also making the decision in advance, like deciding, okay, this is how much I'm going to spend in general on this. This is how much I'm going to spend on that. This is what I'm going to allocate to that. Frees up so much mental RAM. So whenever you're faced with that micro decision of, should I do X or should I do Y? You already know what you should do because you figured it out in advance. And I think another interesting thing is the idea of temporal discounting. It's such a powerful cognitive bias where people make short-term decisions at the expense of their long-term outcomes because totally. they, they feel like watching Netflix as opposed to reading a book or they they feel like eating the hamburger and the cake as opposed to eating a salad and something more healthy. So two things there. You touched on two amazing points. The first is that you have to have, you don't have to have, it's simple. You simplify your life by having maxims that you follow. So like if you create rules that, I mean, rules sounds a bad word because it sounds like you're trapped in this little box that you have to follow. Rules are meant to be broken, sure. But like if you create systems in your life so that you don't have to make decisions all the time, but you have one decision that makes, that eliminates all the rest of the decisions, it's, it's a lot easier. So if you, for example, have a morning routine and you're like, okay, these are the five things I'm going to do the first time I wake up. You don't have to make that decision every single day. So it's like easier to kind of make one decision than it is to make a lot of decisions. And I find that that's quite true in life where you say like, okay, for example, you talked about spending. So one exercise I've done uh, many times in different cities that I spend time in is I've tracked where every single dollar I spend goes in a given month. So I write down literally every single dollar where every single dollar goes, and then I break it down by category. So then I understand, okay, like I'm spending this much categorically in coffee shops and this much on food and this much in these categories. And then I try to understand where the weak spots are and where I could reallocate money in a given month. And then I have an idea, yeah. okay, I've done this, this macro exercise once, but now when I go out and do these things, I understand like, okay, do more of this, do less of that. And so you've, you've made these decisions once that impact all the rest of the decisions that you make on a daily basis because you've analyzed uh, the results in that way. And so I think that's huge. Um, what was the second thing you said? Because I had... <laughs> yeah, the second thing I talked about was temporal dis discounting, which is the trade-off between short-term decisions versus long-term outcomes. Yes. So uh, there's there's so much great stuff on this. I think they did one, um, one uh, study on this where they showed people like what they'll look like in 30 years. And like they, by showing them that person, it changed the way they made decisions today. And I think they did this with like investing or something like that, where like people were more inclined to save or eat healthy or whatever. And so I think that's really, you, that's a really um, great way to think about it. So sometimes I think, because I'm always drawn towards emotion, right? And we, we all are. And this is what we talked about before, where like emotional decisions are the one that are the worst. So for example, I want to eat the whole box of cookies because I feel like, <laughs> like I mean, that's what you want. And you're like, yeah. okay, your logical mind says, okay, I should only eat two or three. So I try and think about like, what will Alec tomorrow morning tell Alec today, for example? Um, and so... I try and look at making decisions in retrospect from that point, from that vantage point, because it creates space between yourself right now and your ego or your emotions. And that's a great place to make decisions. I feel like that's true at the poker table as well. It's, it's about like trying to understand, like, instead of trying to say, what do you want to happen? 
say, asking yourself a fundamental question, which is like, what is the best decision to make at this point in time? So one way yeah. I like to do that to create space to see things more clearly is I, I talk to myself in the third person and it sounds ridiculous and it feels weird. But if you think about it, it's so much easier to understand what your friend should do when you're giving them advice than understand what you should do, right? You ask your friend for advice and they see your situation clear and your friend asks you for advice and you're like, why can't they understand what I'm telling them? It's so obvious to me. And they're sitting there wrapped up in their relationship or whatever it is or their business plan for months or weeks or years and you understand what they should do in a second. And that phenomenon is true because you're not emotionally connected to the outcome. I mean, sure you are, you want the best for your friend, but you're not in it in the first person, you're there in the third person. So what can you do? Well, in real time at the poker table, what I, what I tell my clients, what I do with myself and, and what I've translated into my life is I try and say to myself, okay, I want to win this hand. I want the, the next card to be this, right? I want to I win this pot or this money. But that creates bias. It creates emotion. And that's what you want to mitigate against. So I try and say to myself, okay, what should Alec do here? And so instead of me being in the first person driving the car, I'm in the passenger seat looking at Alec driving the car, or I'm sitting behind Alec at the poker table watching him play the hand against this opponent. So when I create that space between myself, my, 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 you know, my car and my email, I say, okay, what should Alec do here? And whether you can do this, whether you're at the poker table or whether you're deciding what to do after lunch, whether you should do one activity or another, say like, what should Alec do right now? That creates the space to think about the situation objectively. So instead of saying, okay, I want to eat, you know, emotionally, I want to eat all the cookies. What should Alec do? Well, Alec should have two or three because tomorrow Alec's going to be happy. He had a moderate amount, right? It's like a reasonable thing to do. You're not extreme on any one end. And I think you could apply this all the time. Like what should Alec do? Well, uh, he should exercise today. He doesn't really feel like it because he's tired or whatever, but like that's the, the best decision. And so I feel like creating this space really helps me make objective decisions that are optimal that I'm going to be grateful for maybe even in a half hour or two or three hours, maybe if it's in five minutes. Um, but it's not giving into that emotion because those, those are decisions that usually lead to suboptimal decision-making and, and regret. So that's something I've taken from poker that helps me see situations mm. more clearly and apply to the real world as well. That's really cool. That's a really cool insight. I mean, something that I usually do is to, to snap myself out of a rut is your brain is having these thoughts, but I would literally say, yeah, I'm going to get up now and I'm going to put on my trainers and I'm going to leave and I'm going to stop watching this crap. But I think adding that third person element really yeah. extra separates. I'm going to start doing that. That's great. I love that. I, I really want to really try that. It weird in the beginning because it sounds like, I mean, yeah. the only time you hear people talking in third person is when they're, sorry, is when they're extremely arrogant, right? Like you hear someone saying like, oh, John is going to go now. And you're like, who the hell says that about themselves, right? But yeah. when, when you're using it as like a, sort of like a hack, it, it, it's really yeah. useful to be like, okay, Alec, get off the couch. And then you can like see yourself getting off the couch and moving and then you can like do it. So yeah, I exactly. find that it, it really helps um, at the poker table, especially when there's so much emotion and so much ego at stake and you're mm. really trying to mitigate against that. So you're saying like, okay, Alec, the best play is just to fold, wait for the next hand, be patient. And then you see yourself doing it. And then you see Alec doing it, excuse me, right? To keep the analogy. And then it's easier to come back into the first person in the yeah. driver's seat and then execute on what you know to be true. For sure. Yeah. That, that's, that's, a, that's a fantastic analogy. I think the Thank separation you. makes a huge, huge difference. And another thing that you were touching on earlier was the idea of systems. And I get the impression that you're a very organized person and that a lot of your life and business is systematized. That's yes. my impression. So <laughs> you're right. I was, <laughs> I was wondering, and obviously, because the idea that, you know, you fall to the level of your systems at the end of the day. And I think having strong systems and automated systems in your life frees up so much extra time for you to focus on the things that you either need to or want to focus on. So I was wondering what kind of systems do you have in your life and business that enable you to do that? So that's a good question. I start from the premise of like, what am I, what am I not replaceable at? Like, what is the reason that Alec or I, however you want to think about it, maybe you want, maybe you like that third person. So what is the reason that I am really um, providing value to my audience, right? Or my business? Like where is, where, what, what cannot absolutely be outsourced? Or for example, if you wanted to rank the different activities you do and assign a dollar value to them and categorize them, you say, okay, like I have activities that are worth, you know, a thousand an hour, activities that are worth 200 an hour and activities that are worth 20 an hour that I do, right? Like Mm. we're being a little extreme and polar, but like 
there's typically activities that you do that are really valuable, mediocre value, and not valuable at all. And so I try and find my, I try and say, like, how do I, what are the activities? First, identify where the activities are that are worth a thousand an hour or the highest level. And then what are the other activities? And now I get all a list of all these things. So now I have a clear idea of like, what am I great at that is irreplaceable? And what are the activities that need to be done, but that I'm not as good as someone else? Or another way to do it is you assign an hourly rate to your, you assign a value to your hourly rate. So for example, you can figure out what your hourly rate is worth. This is kind of harder as an entrepreneur because you're not necessarily getting paid per hour to do an activity. You're just working a certain amount of time and you're making a certain amount of year or whatever. But you can say, okay, my time is worth this. And once you have that figure, anything that's worth less than that for you to do, you don't do. I had to do this in poker in the early years where like we still were, um, we still were having movies where you could return them at the store. And I remember we had like, there was this policy at Blockbuster, which now is out of business, but um, where like, if you didn't return a movie, it cost a certain amount. And I was like thinking, yeah. and this is maybe is like kind of stupid, but I was thinking at the time, like, okay, well, like how, how much will it, how long will it take me to actually go and return that movie? And like, can I make more money playing online poker in that hour than it will take me to go return that movie at Blockbuster? And like, this is sort of simplified, but it's just a general idea that helps conceptualize the idea of like assigning, attributing a value to your hourly. And then, you know, if you find enjoyment in the, in the errand or the activity you're doing, by all means do it. Cause there's maybe no price on those things. Obviously like walking your dog doesn't have a cost because you enjoy yeah. it. So you're not going to outsource everything. But once you have these activities and once you've assigned an hourly rate to your time, you can say to yourself, okay, like how much can I afford to spend outsource? Number one, because if it's worth less than your hourly, you outsource it. If it's worth your hourly or more, you just do it yourself. So there might be situations, and I have this all the time in my business, where I do things I don't necessarily love, but because the cost to outsource isn't really worth it or whatever, or it'll only take me an hour and there's there's a cost involved in outsourcing, I don't do that. But for the other things that like other people are great at, right? They're as good as I am in my core activity, but they're this good at that activity that needs to be outsourced. And they, and the cost is worth it because for me, this is a low priority item, but the cost to outsource is also low. I find other people who are great at that activity and I pay slightly more than I would say the, that you can pay to find great talent at that activity. So I would rather pay 1.3 X to find someone that's great than one X to find someone that's decent because the, the, what I find in, in outsourcing is that, um, the, the increase, again, it's all comes back to protecting your time. So the, the value in having it done right the first time and not having to oversee or micromanage a project will save you more in money than it will in the time value of your money. So for example, if you can pay 1.5 X and have it done right the first time or pay one X and have it done in two times, well, you're spending twice as much time on that activity. And since your hourly rate is worth more than the activity, you're losing money when you convert the the time you're spending to dollars. So it's worth it to pay a little bit more to have better labor. Better, better partners, better collaborators. For so sure. I find those people on Upwork. I have a blog called How to Outsource on Upwork. It's on alectrelli.com. It's free. It's probably like six pages. It's like a complete guide of how I find amazing freelancers at decent prices by us- utilizing people from all over the world. And I found nice. almost everyone I've worked with that way. And um, you could find amazing people. Like for example, my accountant is incredible. He does. We work together to do my QuickBooks. He's in uh, in the Middle East, and I can, for a fraction of what I would pay perhaps elsewhere, I can let, I can utilize someone that's an A player for a fraction of the cost to do something that it would drive me absolutely bananas to do, I'm not good at, and the cost to outsource is very low compared to what I value my time at, and so it's just a, a win-win-win all across the board. He does a better job than I could do, it's done at a fraction of the cost, and it's done right the first time. And so that's a little bit of my process and systems and as many things as I can do and outsource, I do. I always do them myself first so that I know how to do them because you have to speak the language, A, to vet your, your workers, to be able to vet the people and ask the intelligent questions, mm-hmm. to understand the systems well enough to be able to ensure that you're training them well. And typically I find if the job is not done right, it's your fault. It's either your fault for not hiring the person that is good enough because you have a B or a C player and you have to fire them and get a new person, 
or it's your fault because you didn't train them or delegate well enough. So I'm a big fan of understanding exactly what needs to be done myself. I edited videos, for example, for a long time. So I know how to edit videos. Now I can outsource that task. I have a good idea of how long it should take someone to do that. So I understand if they're, they're charging a fair rate and I understand what tasks to give them and what is capable and what is possible because I've done it myself. So I've gotten good or at least not good necessarily, but competent at all the activities of my business before I outsource them. And then I create systematic training videos to give to people that they can, they can watch at any time so that my time spent outsourcing is um, fixed in case I need to get a new person. And before I hire them, I always tell them if they do end up moving on to another job, they have to give me two, two weeks notice. And part of their paid arguably uh, job is to train the next person. So that's a little Mm. bit of my process. I I try to cover as much as I can without, you know, I mean, getting into everything about the business. Obviously, we only have so much time, but that's a little bit of my process. That's really smart. I'm wondering on that topic, because for a lot of young entrepreneurs who are starting out, they probably don't have the finances to outsource initially. So Mm -hmm. one, at what point do you know that you can outsource? And two, what other kind of systems can younger entrepreneurs who maybe don't have that leverage yet in their life what can they implement to make sure that everything runs smoothly on a system basis? Totally. So in the beginning, like I said, you have to be a practitioner. You have to do everything yourself. You have to know everything about your business to be able to outsource it. Otherwise, you don't know if it's being run properly. Someone could just you know, drive you for a spin because they're telling you, oh, it costs this much and you have no idea. So I yeah. would confidently say I've done everything myself in the business with the exception of coding the website, but I got a little bit of understanding about that. Um, because you have to. And in the beginning, you have to hustle, right? You don't have the the bankroll, as we call it in poker, the money to do things your own. So you have to do it yourself. And that just sucks. But in the beginning, your your asset is time because you're young and you have a lot of time and you have no other responsibility, but you're not, you're not, Mm. you know, you don't necessarily have other things to do. So you can afford to spend all of your time on your business. So this is, this works out really well. This ends up being a balanced trade. You're using the asset you have and the leverage you have, which is time. The point in which you know you can outsource is when you attribute a value to your time that is worth more and maybe even 25% more than the cost of outsourcing that task. And you started outsourcing the tasks that you hate the most, that are the cheapest, and that will take the most amount of your time. And typically, hopefully you could find you know, one task that is fits all three pillars of that triangle. That would be ideal, yeah. right? For me, it's the accounting, for example. It's something I suck at, I hate doing, and it's very cheap, and it takes a lot of time. So like yeah. something that, for example, could be everyone's thing, where they outsource their QuickBooks, for example, so they don't have to deal with it. Um, but there are a lot of tasks like this, like, you know, maybe your graphic design, for example, um, you just, maybe you don't even, you can't even do it and it's just something else you have to get done. And you can find something like on Fiverr for $5, you find a design or 99 designs for a hundred dollars. Uh, you get an amazing design or logo. So these are things that you can start at, at the beginning. Um, as for ways to be more efficient when you can't do these things, I think technology is your best friend. So understanding what are the systems we talked about before that you need to learn that are going to save you a lot of time in the future? So let me give you a few examples. One is like an email provider, right? Like if you're running an online business, you're generating uh, traffic to your site, for example, you need to capture emails or leads. And the way yeah. to do that is through an email provider. So understanding like, okay, this is how I build an autoresponder campaign so that every time someone opts in, I don't have to send them an email, but I give them an autoresponder. And you try and make it personal and engaging as much as possible. And I spent a lot of time on that when someone opts into Conscious Poker or AlexTorelli.com, they get like a sequence of emails, but I spent a lot of time on those. I try to make them as personal as possible. But that way when I'm reading emails, they've already read one or two or three of my emails. So I understand the types of responses that I get. I've even gone so far as to say, you're typically one of these three types of people. These are the three categories of people that, that follow me. Which one are mm-hmm. you? So like I've kind of done the legwork for them so that all they have to do is respond and say which category they are. So then I've like saved my, I've created a system that saved me multiple emails of back and forth so that when I'm engaging with someone, I do read all my own email. I respond to all my own email. It does take a lot of time, but I've, I've like taken off a lot of the legwork. The second is to create systems which take away a lot of other decisions. So for example, if you have a product or something and you notice yourself getting asked a lot of questions in customer service via email, create an FAQ page where like people are, you know, having all of those questions, then you can send people to landing pages or links about content. 
And I do that with my content as well. I get a question 50 times. I realize there's a gap in the content I need to create. So I create a pillar piece of content that I could point people to. The last is to use a system to manage your time. I personally use Trello. I have a free video, how to use Trello for beginners on my YouTube, youtube.com slash Alec Torelli and uh, how to use Slack as well. And so by creating systems that help you be more efficient with your time and organize your tasks, Trello is a task manager that's digital. Uh, it really helps you leverage technology to be more efficient with your time so that your time ends up being worth more. So you spend less of your time on low productivity items and more of your time on those high productivity items. Uh, and just being more organized with your tasks, like breaking down your to-do list between what you have to do today, this week, and this month, and your three-month goals really helps you prioritize your tasks and just be more efficient. So when you get in the office in the morning, you look at your Trello. If everything is already labeled out, you just start working. Yeah. It's so true. I think people often think, oh, but it's going to take me so much time to figure this out. But when you, again, when you think about the short term versus the long term, in the long term, it's going to save you so much time as opposed to, you know, you taking that that day to figure out how to automate through Excel or that day to figure out yes. basic Python or just technical or AWeb or whatever it is. Like it just makes such a difference in the long term. And um, kind of going back to the idea of decision making, I know that in poker, taking calculated risks is a big thing. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah. So, I mean, I try and think about it in terms of like risk reward and I try and bet on things that are asymmetric. So what are things that have great upside and small downside? And so I'm always evaluating my worst case scenario, whether it's me going into a poker session and evaluating how much money I'm going to I'm going to risk. I always say, okay, what is the most I can lose? We call it a stop loss. So what is the absolute worst case scenario? And if that situation triggers, how will I feel? So I always want to be like, if the worst case scenario happens, I know that I, in retrospect, would still have made the best decision. That's the most important thing. And so before I sit down at any poker station, I'm always in that boat. So no matter what happens, I like I, it, I could lose money, but in a way I can't lose because I know I made the right decision that's fiscally responsible and also psychologically and mentally something that I'm comfortable with. Uh, and then I look for things in, in poker and life where I have asymmetric risk rewards. So what are the bets that I can make where there's a great upside and not a lot of downside? So if it's an investment, that's kind of obvious. What are the things that I think are, are the most lucrative with the least amount of risk? But if it's, uh, it's something like poker, it might be, or, or something in life, it might be like something like, okay, when I, for example, I was at SMU when I was in uh, Dallas, Texas, and I was 18, 19, I was doing very well in poker. And I, I, I got to a point in my career where I was at a, like, I sort of hit a plateau. Like I couldn't get any better or dedicate any more time or reach that next level, which for me was traveling around the world and playing in the, in the tournament circuit, which was similar to like golf or tennis, the PGA or the ATP tour, where there's these events that tra travel around because I was in school. Right. And I didn't have the time yeah. or I didn't, I couldn't did, or I obviously couldn't just like jump on a plane and go somewhere. So there were all these limitations I had because of this other activity. So then I said to myself, okay, like I want to commit myself to playing poker and really try and test my luck of being a professional and go all in. But at the same time, what is the worst thing that could happen? Is this a responsible decision? My, my intuition says that I think I can do this and I think I should do it. I think at the time is now, I think I have the talent, but what is, you know, let, let's, let's find the marriage between logic and intuition. Does the, the, the business plan fit my gut instinct? So I said to myself, okay, I've saved up whatever, 20, 30,000 that I've made playing poker. I'm 18. The worst thing that happens is that I'm 19, right? I, I give myself a year. I lose all the money I've saved and I'm back at SMU a year later and I'm a year behind, so to speak, all of these other college students, right? I still don't have any money. Nobody else does. I don't know what I'm doing with my life. Nobody else does. And I'm one year older than them. So that's like really realistic and really worst case scenario. The yeah. best case scenario is that I make it. And there's like unlimited upside to what that could mean. I could, I could become one of the best players in the world, traveling around, living my dream life, playing high stakes poker, traveling the world. That is, that is a possibility. It's not necessarily guaranteed by any means, but it is one of the upside possibilities. Or there's all these shades of gray in between. I could just become moderately successful and make a certain amount and pay my bills and play poker and then pivot to something else later or whatever. Yeah. 
So I looked at all these upsides and I looked at my downside and I also gave myself a reasonable time frame. And I said to myself, okay, like if I'm not successful after a year and I had these metrics that I wanted to hit for success, what that mean to me, it wasn't just money, but it was like these other metrics, whatever. Uh, then I'm going to go back to school. So I had a backup plan and I had asymmetric risk reward. And I said, okay, if, you know, by the time I'm, I'll say 22, 23, I'm not, you know, I haven't done this, then I'm going to find another career path while I'm still, again, young, with no responsibility, no debt, whatever, right? I'm not taking on debt and going to school. Um, so I looked at this like an asymmetric bet that I could make. And so to me, it seemed clear that like, if I'm not going to take a risk in my life to do something I really love at a point in my life where there's limited downside and dramatic upside, I'm never going to do it. I'm not going to do it when I'm married with two kids and I'm 40, but I might do it when I'm 18. So like, if I'm not going to go all in now, I'm sort of like never going to go all in on anything. Um, so that was a situation in my life where I looked for how to calculate risk uh, that I've sort of learned from poker where I, I thought about how to manage money and how to like, you know, understand what I can win and lose in a given day and whatnot. And then apply those theories to decisions I make in the real world. And I still do that to this day. You know, I still do that uh, all, all the time, yeah. really. Yeah, that, that's really powerful. Just taking a framework and quantifying things and actually taking the time to write things out and like literally create a battle plan of sort of wins and losses makes such a big difference. Um, so it's really, really interesting to hear your perspective on that. And another thing that I was thinking about, this is a really pretentious poker analogy, but I thought it'd be interesting to ask you, which is the whole idea okay. of, you know, how everyone has dealt a hand in life. And so no matter what hand you're dealt with, you've got to kind of make the most of your cards. And it's a really pretentious analogy kind of linking poker to life. But I was wondering if you had any specific thoughts on that idea. Wow, this is great. This is actually one of the subjects of uh, a, a keynote I gave. So nice. yeah, in, in poker, we have a saying where you can't control the hand you're dealt, only how you play the cards. So yeah. my premise is that if you look at the hand you're dealt and you're listening to this podcast, you're born in the first world. Like if you look at it objectively, it's easy to say that, you know, oh, I was dealt a bad hand because of this. And we only compare ourselves to the highlight reel of other people's life on social media. So it seems like, you know, we're only comparing up. We're only looking at the people that are ahead of us. And there's always someone at a higher mountain. So it seems like we've been dealt a mediocre average or a bad hand. But if you look at the whole spectrum, uh, and you can measure this in, in so many different ways, um, there, I feel like it's quite objective that most people... I think would, that would be listening would be dealt a winning hand, a very good hand. You wouldn't, you wouldn't want to, another way to think about it is you, you know, half the world lives on 250 a day or less. So if you're not, you know, like just think about that, right? Like, so you're automatically winning if you're not born into that reality. Um, but also like, if you think about it, would you really trade your life right now, your hand for a random hand in the world? A random hand could be anyone in any country in any upbringing. I mean, most people would be like, okay, I would, I would, I could imagine maybe trading it some people wouldn't trade it for anything and that's a great place to be in. But um, some people might say, okay, like I could trade it up for, to be Brad Pitt. Okay, sure. But like, would you trade it for anything? Because that is what it mm. means to be Delta hand. Delta hand means you're in no control. It's completely random. It could be anything. So the first yeah. part of the equation I think is realizing that you were dealt a winning hand in life. Like you were, you're dealt something that is playable. And just because someone else's is more playable, sure. But like any hand that's playable could be a winner. And it's ultimately up to you to play the hand the best way possible because it's not only about the hand you're dealt, it's largely about how you play the cards. And those who play their cards better, extrapolated over a long sample size, will win. In the short term, anyone could win because there's luck. So in any given day, you know, what, you know, something could happen to someone or whatever. But if you continually make bets when the odds are in your favor, you're going to end up pretty much where you're supposed to be in the long term, which is why, you know, the house always wins. On any given day, you and I could go to the casino, on a roulette wheel and maybe you hit 36, you hit your number and you win. But if you bet that money on a roulette wheel enough times, the win is going to walk away with your money. This is why they're a billion dollar organization. You know, they're, <laughs> they're worth billions of dollars <laughs> yeah. because they, they make bets when the odds are in their favor. So if you continue to show up every single day and you put the odds in your favor and you play your hand well, you will win in the long term usually. So I like yeah. to to keep that perspective. I keep my, try to keep my feet on the ground and say like, even if I'm having a bad, terrible day, I wouldn't trade my life or situation for anything or any random situation because I was dealt a winning hand. How can I focus all of my energy 
on playing the hand the best way possible. And if you look at the difference between a good player and a mediocre player or, or, or a professional and an amateur, a lot of times amateurs will come up to you or tell you a hand of poker and they'll say, oh, look at this hand. I got so unlucky. Can you believe this happened to me? And they're, they're a victim mentality or they'll say they'll focus on a hand where they played their hand perfectly, but the outcome wasn't what they wanted. So they're focused on the wrong thing. They're focused on the outcome. They're focused on something they can't change. You talk to a professional poker player and they'll tell you, hey, look, I won this hand, but I'm upset because I could have won more, not because they're greedy or arrogant, but because they're focused on optimizing their decision-making process because they know that in the long term, it's those who make the best decisions and play their cards well that end up on top. And so it's mm -hmm. about focusing on what you can control and forgetting about the rest. Yeah, it's so true. I think a lot of people use the circumstances that they find themselves in. A lot of people use their hand as a sort of excuse, but instead of using it as an excuse, look at all of the different hands that people are dealt with in a world. And I think that puts you in such a frame of gratitude that reminds yeah. you sort of to keep yourself in a positive frame of mind and an opportunity seeking frame of mind. And uh, it, instead of seeing all of the problems, you see all of the opportunities, which means you can do such amazing things. And, yeah, um, even if you were, even if you do look at this on a and say, my hand, 40th percentile, because whatever reason, which it feels hard to believe when half the world lives on 250 a day, but let's say you feel like your hand is worse than whatever. Like at the end of the day, there's there comes a point when you, you can't control that. So like there comes a point where you, you have to, to either you, you either have two options and it's quite binary. Either you can lament about that for an undefined period of time, or there comes a point, whether it's now or in five years or 10 years where you say, okay, I don't, I'm going to let that go because I can't control that. And I'm only going to spend my attention on producing the best outcome. I'm going to, I'm going to make lemonade. If, if you truly were dealt lemons, you're going to make lemonade, but that's all you can do. You might not be able to be whatever. You might not be able to be at the 99th percentile because you weren't dealt a winning hand. I understand there's like, there's, there's truth in this, in the sense that the better hand you're dealt, the more odds you have of winning. But at some point you have to say like, I can only do the best with what I have, you know? Yeah, that's so true. Um, I am conscious of time, but I do want to ask you one question before I ask you my final question. Let's do and it. that is that you keep yeah, you keep mentioning, you know, you did a keynote on this and you did a keynote on that. And I, I saw that you did a keynote for War Room and things like that. So yeah. I think it's awesome. And I was wondering how for for entrepreneurs who want to start getting into speaking, oh, okay. how do you get gigs like that? And how can you make sure that you structure a really good speech? Okay. So I'm by no means like the world-class expert on this. So take everything mm -hmm. I say with a grain of salt. I'll give you my experience. I mean, this, the starting out is you have to put your message out there and you have to get clear on what your message is and you have to understand why you're unique and someone will want to listen to you. So everybody, mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of people have a message. Your job is to figure out what it is and yeah. why your angle on your message is unique to you based on your experience. And it usually comes down to what you know very, very well that other people don't. So for me, I, you know, I could talk about business and entrepreneurship, but I'm not going to compete with Gary Vee. But like if I come at it from a place of, hey, this is what I learned in poker that teaches me about business, Gary Vee can't compete with me. And that's a good place mm -hmm. to be in because I've created a unique niche. I've created something based on what I'm truly great at. So stop, I think it's about stop trying to be, you know, someone you're not and really go all in on who you are because that's ultimately the message that you have that's unique. Then you have to put that message out there. And by putting it out there, usually in written form in some capacity, written form really helps you get clear on what your message is. Because if you, even if you create a, a podcast or a YouTube video, you can, you can go in circles and, and just kind of throw thoughts out there. But if you write something... Yeah. You have, it's, the, it's the ultimate form of clarity. So I start my ideas in a written form. I usually try and put them in a tweet because the less characters you have, the more clear you have to be. I'll tweet out an idea and I'll see if it sticks. If it sticks, I'll turn it into an Instagram post and a Facebook post. If it sticks, I'll turn it into a blog post, which will eventually get turned into a YouTube video, which will eventually be a keynote. So I actually work from the place of what is the most concise way I can say this idea and if mm -hmm. that is, a, it also requires the least amount of time. So I'm probing the world to see if they're giving me feedback. If they give me feedback, it means I have something that sticks. Then I put my message out there. I build an audience and, you know, people have come to me and asked me to give keynotes because I've talked about things publicly that people value. That's what I'm doing here. Maybe someone listening is like, oh, wow, this guy, 
I resonate with Alec in a way, let me hit him up and see if he wants to speak at our event. Right. So yeah, at some point it's about putting yourself out there, but you first have to get clear on who you are, put your message out there, ideally build an audience and then reverse engineer to get keynotes that way. When it comes to producing a good speech, I feel like the key is really telling stories that convey the principles of what you want to say. So in writing, we have a saying like show, don't tell. And I think in speaking, it's about, it's about sharing didactic stories that teach a message, not just saying, Hey, this is what you should do. This is what the data says. This is what the point is. It's about like sharing a story that people can connect to emotionally, drawing an emotional, like a pathos uh, ethos sort of response and then really backing that up with numbers or, or logic. And so in my keynotes, I like to tell stories. I, I alluded to a few of them here about, you know, macro and micro decisions, buying a dog. I talk about the decision of how I ended up deciding whether or not I wanted to marry my wife. And I use that as a framework for how to make decisions in the real world, how you use a combination of logic and intuition when you're making decisions. And I talk about the biggest decision I made in my life, which was deciding to marry Ambra. And so that is really compelling because I tell the story of how we met serendipitously when I moved to Italy and I was 24 and I walked into her office. And so you have the audience like, Oh my God, that's crazy. What a amazing. Story. And then, and they're at a peak emotional state because they're excited about what you're saying. And they're like, they're, they're, they lost in this flow state of you just con- conversationally telling a story, just like you would if you sat down with three friends, Holy shit, guess what happened last night? Can you believe it? Boom. You tell a story. I do that on stage and then you tie it into your overall message. So I feel like if you can do that, it almost takes the, the fear out of speaking because you just feel like you're just talking to a friend or two. And that's, that's a great place to come from. And I feel like the best talks I give are the ones where it's the most conversational. Yeah, it's so true. Um, humans are really motivated and really intrigued by stories. Like humans are emotional creatures. They're not yeah. rational creatures. So when you feed the story into everything you do, the human brain, the mind is so much more engaged. Um, totally. And I think that the idea of sort of with the law of category, I like I love the way that you create your own category as instead, instead of trying to compete in a c- category where there's always already top people, you know, you can't compete in that. You just create your own. That really sets you apart. I heard a great, uh, I went to a marketing conference a couple of years ago and I heard this, um, this guy speak, who was like a superstar affiliate marketer. And he said, you have to be the best or the first. Yeah. And it's really true. Like Gary Vee is the best, but like, you know, are you going to be the best social media marketer or are you going to be the first, whatever? I'm not that I'm trying to be, I'm just using an example that most people I feel like following your podcast would know. Are you going to be the, yeah. the best at, you know, the lessons you learned from lacrosse because you were, you know, an all-star lacrosse player that apply to psychology, you know, or like teamwork and then teamwork applies to business, right? So you see all these things being niched out and there's like the Navy SEAL that ends up sharing the lessons he learned in the speech, you know, make your bed or whatever, right? And so it's like, he's a Navy SEAL and he's, he's speaking to the corporate business world or, or the populace, but he's doing it from a place of being who he is. So it's really about, about that place. And that's, that's where I think you can get ahead. Yeah. That's so powerful. So the final question that I want to ask you is what are the three key truth bombs about the entrepreneurial journey that you would drop on a young entrepreneur today? Three main points. Ooh, There's a lot to choose from. I know. Mm. Three key points. I should have been prepared for this because I knew you were going to ask this. (laughs) Points for a young entrepreneur starting their journey today. The first, no particular order not necessarily the top three. I'm thinking on my head, I should have been prepared. The first sure. is to understand what tool you are and find the appropriate thing that makes your tool useful. So if you're a hammer, look for nails. Uh, the second thing is to trust your intuition because it's usually right and believe in yourself because typically the people around you don't believe in you necessarily until you've been successful, but being able to understand when people are not believing in you because your idea is shit versus they're just doubting or for whatever reason. So being able to have the humility to understand the difference between those two things, but also having the self-confidence to bet against the market, right? So everything popular is wrong from Oscar Wilde. So if you, if you're confident enough in your idea, then to go with it and try the third thing I would say, oh man, young entrepreneurs. The third thing is that the 
best asset you have is time. And so to use that as leverage because you have a lot of time. So try a lot of new things, find what works and don't settle for something that you don't absolutely love. And then realize the place of money in your life and money gives you a lot of options. And while it's cool at a young age, especially in a social media world to punt a lot of money on things you don't need to impress people you don't know, realize that money gives you a lot of options as you get older. So save as absolutely as much as you can, because when you do find luck is where preparation meets opportunity. So when you do find that idea or that person or that whatever that you want and that you find the North star and the macro that you actually value having more resources to accentuate that goal is super useful. So save as much as you can because it will just give you options in the future to find what it is you truly value. Fantastic message. Those are great truths, Alec. Okay, no I'm sorry that wasn't so concise. That. Yeah, no, that was fantastic. Um, so now is your opportunity to plug anything you would like to plug? Um, sure. I mean, if you want to know more about me, I'm at Alec Torelli, A-L-E-C-T-O-R-E-L-L-I on all socials. I'm very active. Like I said, I read all my own email, Definitely check all my own comments on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever. So hit me up. Uh, if you want to learn poker, if you want to know more about me, I'm, uh, alectrelli.com. I share thoughts about life in the world business. If you want to know about poker specifically, uh, at conscious poker and on YouTube, we have 500 videos, 50,000 subs. So we put a lot of content out on there. Um, and then consciouspoker.com for all poker strategies. So that's how you can get in touch with me. Come say that you saw me on this show. You heard me on the show. I'd love to say hi and know your favorite talking point and um, just get to know you. Sure, come say hey. Awesome. I'll plop that all in the show notes. And thank you so much for taking the time to come on here today, Alec. Really appreciate it. Thanks, this was awesome. You were great. Thank you. It was my pleasure.